Hello everyone, hope you're all fine and doing great. Depending on where you're from, I would like to wish you a very good morning, good afternoon, or good evening. Welcome to the webinar today. This is part two of our webinar series on machine learning in STEM. And today we're gonna to talk about the evolution of machine learning in cybersecurity and what we have in store for the future. We'll also spend some time looking closely at how a SIM solution actually implements machine learning algorithms to detect anomalies in the network so that attackers can be kept away. Uh, before I go ahead, I would like to take a few seconds, maybe about five to 10 seconds, and make sure that you can all hear me loud and clear, and that my slides are also visible on your screen. So if you can confirm this for me with a yes or good to go on chat, that would be really great. Uh, again, I'm just looking for a confirmation from people that everything is fine and there are no glitches, there are no technical issues, and then we can get started. All right, I seem to have got a few confirmations. Thank you so much for those confirmations. Thank you so much. Uh, a quick introduction about myself before we step into the agenda. Uh, my name is Ram Vaidyanathan, and I'm a product marketing manager in Manage Engine's IT security and SIM solutions team. As part of my role, I need to keep myself updated about the latest methods attackers are adopting to take down organizations and how organizations can use effective defense mechanisms to protect themselves. I'm especially interested about how AI and ML can be used in cyber defense and how organizations can make better use of this technology in the days, months, and years to come. Um, if you'd like to get in touch with me about anything once this webinar is done, that's absolutely fine. My email address is right there on your screen. It's ram.v at manageengine.com. Please send me an email and I'll certainly get back to you. So we'll just be stepping into the agenda right now. So here's the agenda for the webinar. We'll first see how machine learning is practically used in a SEM solution to bring value to security analysts. As part of this, we'll talk about intuitive dashboards, anomaly reports, risk scoring, peer grouping, and alerting. For this first part of the webinar, I'll be using Manage Engine Log 360 to show how things actually work. We'll then talk about two popular machine learning algorithms that are used in cybersecurity. These would be RPCA, or Robust Principal Component Analysis, and Markov Chains. We'll see how these algorithms work and how they can be used to identify deviant or abnormal behavior. And then finally, we'll talk about what the future has in store for us. We'll discuss how attackers can use AI and ML to further their nefarious activities and how organizations can use AI and ML to defend themselves. So yes, it goes both ways. Attackers can use uh, AI and so can defenders. So this is what we have in store for the next 35 minutes. I hope you find this session useful. So without any further delay, let's talk about how machine learning is used in Log360 to detect anomalies for our customers. So I'll be jumping into the console of Log360 right now to show this to you. So here is the dashboard of Log360 UEBA, which is the anomaly detection and machine learning module of Log360. Now here you can see that um, you know, there are quite a few things um, under anomaly trends. Uh, you see that there is a total of close to 360,000 events that have been ingested. From these ingested events, around 73,000 anomalies have been detected so far. Also, we see that there are 1428 users and 342 entities that are being tracked in real time and analyzed for anomalies. And then take a look at this. Here are the recent alerts that are observed in the network. So at first glance, a security analyst will be able to get to know if any user or entity has done any anomalous activity for which an alert has been configured. These alerts are configured through rules that the security analyst can actually write. But you know, there are some predefined alerts that come with the solution as well. But apart from this, apart from the alerts, what if there are anomalies that are important to look at but have not been configured at, as alerts yet? This situation can arise in any organization. Well, that's the information that recent anomalies can give an analyst. So apart from the alerts, it's always uh, necessary for an analyst to also look at the recent anomalies. Now take a look at this. Here are the anomaly trends over time. The time range that is under analysis here in this graph, uh, you know, the time that is under review can be changed 
from up over here. So you can go back in time and uh, see what anomalies you got in the past as well. The top 10 anomalous activities are shown over here. Just take a look at this over here. So him immediately having a look at this, an analyst knows that most of the anomalies have to do with SQL DDL queries. There are also numerous Windows registry activities that are abnormal. Windows file activities are at third place. So we have about 79, 40 anomalies when it comes to Windows registry activities and 5,400 anomalies when it comes to Windows file activities. Of course, the biggest concern is SQL DDL queries, which is about 13,640 anomalies. Now, anomalies based on categories tell the analyst the category of devices that led to most anomalies. Now, here in this lab setup, Windows devices were associated with uh, close to 24,000 anomalies. The other important thing on this dashboard is the risk level of users. So let me quickly show you that. Here are the risk level of users and entities as well. So you can make a, ch a choice over here. So let's look at the risk level of users. So here we are asking the question, out of the 1428 users in the network, how many have a risk score above a certain range? So let's say out of these 1428 uh, users, how many have a risk score over 50, for example? So a risk score, by the way, can range anywhere between one to 100. And usually a risk score above 50 means that it is a notable user or an entity. So you can see here that uh, there are 1428 users in total. But if I were to select particular risk scores or risk score distribution rather, you see that between the scores of 51 and 75, we do have three users who lay in that particular range. And these are probably notable users that the security analyst needs to keep a closer eye on. So that's what the risk level is going to tell an analyst. So now let's go on to the anomaly reports and talk about the three types of anomalies. So I'm just going to go, going to go into this tab here. And there are three types of anomalies that Log360 analyzes. These would be your time, count, and pattern anomalies. The very first thing that you'll see here on this page is the dropdown. So you see that there's a dropdown here. So let's go ahead and select devices. So the devices for which anomalies can be detected are Windows, Unix, and Cisco routers. And these on the left-hand side are the different categories of anomalies when it comes to Windows devices. Likewise, you can have anomalies for Unix and Cisco routers as well. So here are the different categories of anomalies for your Unix devices and your Cisco routers. So thankfully, there are no anomalies, no um, analyzed anomalies for your Cisco routers right now. Now, in the same way, you can also have uh, anomaly reports for applications, uh, such as Active Directory. You can have uh, anomaly reports for your firewall devices from various vendors that you see up over here. You can also have anomalies for your cloud services, and that would include your AWS, uh, Azure, and Google. But anyways, to understand this better, for now, let's go ahead and choose devices. And let's take a uh, look at a few example reports. So let's look at logon anomalies for Windows based on users. So we are looking at logon anomalies uh, for Windows devices. It's going to be a time-based anomaly that we are looking at. And we are going to be choosing users. So already we are doing quite a lot of filtration here. And we are looking at this particular report. I'll take a look at this. So here in this report, take a look at the first row. We see that this particular user successfully logged on to this host at 4.15 p.m. Now, this is actually deviant behavior for this user who's only expected to log on between 4 and 4.15 a.m. So that's what is expected. So this user is actually deviating from what's normal and Log360 is uh, detecting that as an anomaly. Now, if a security analyst goes into view details, you get more granular information. So this gives anomaly visualization and also some contextual information uh, if they go into event details. So a lot more information about the anomaly can be found over here. So this happens to be an example of a time anomaly. For count anomalies, let's take the example of a software being installed on a host an abnormal number of times. So we'll go into a different uh, report right now. 
So let's go to system activities. And we're looking at software installations, abnormal software installations at that. Um, we are looking at, uh, at an example of a count anomaly. So let's go into count based. And these are software installations done by particular users. So we'll have to select users as the criteria. Now take a look at this report. So this report tells you that this particular software, so Oracle BM, from this particular vendor was installed by this user on this host. How many times? 250 times, which is a huge deviation from the seven that's expected. A security analyst may want to take a closer look at this. So this happens to be a huge anomaly. It's a count anomaly. Now the third type of anomaly is the pattern anomaly. When it comes to pattern anomalies, we are not looking at variances in a single variable, such as time or count. That's what the time and the count anomalies are for after all. But when it comes to pattern anomalies, we look at a sequence. So I'll give you an example of a pattern anomaly right now. Uh, let's go to registry activities, abnormal registry activities, and we'll be looking at deleted actions. Take a look at this, deleted registry activities. Now take a look at this report. And uh, we have time, count, and pattern based uh, here. So let's go ahead and choose pattern. That's what we are looking at. Now take a look at this report. So here we have this user, UEBA user one, on this particular host, this is the IP address of the host, deleting a registry. Now, so this is a uh, registry deletion activity that's happening. Uh, this is the object name. The pattern that's being analyzed is shown to you right here. The pattern that's analyzed is host name, username, domain, and time. So four different variables are put together and analyzed. If this particular pattern uh, followed by this user, it's actually okay. So that's the analysis right here. Now this pattern, well, everything seems to be fine except the host name and the username. That is the obtained value. Take a look at this. What's obtained is this user is doing some activity on this particular host. But what is expected is this. From the looks of it, UEBA user two is expected to use this particular host for this activity. But this activity is being performed by UEBA user one, and that is deviant behavior. Now, believe it or not, a lot of adversaries perform registry deletions to hide their footprints or hide configuration information. This could very well be a technique of defense evasion. And security analysts need to be concerned about such activity. Because one of the, one of the first things that an attacker, a sophisticated attacker does after they come onto the network, after they get that initial foothold into the network, is they try and delete things uh, that are evidence. They want to take away any evidence, right? They don't want to let the analyst know that they have ever been there. So this could very well be such an activity. It's an activity of defense evasion. And Law 360 UEBA is telling a security analyst that they need to take a closer look and investigate this particular action. Similarly, for pattern anomalies, we can also look at file activities. So let's go ahead and do that. This is extremely important when it comes to intellectual property theft or IT sabotage. Um, so we can look at file activities. We can look at read activities in particular. Now take a look at this report, pattern-based once again. So the read anomalies could indicate some sort of an intellectual property theft. So is there some person who is unauthorized to read a certain file? Probably it's business secrets or some sort of a trademark file. So has a person who is unauthorized actually come, you know, gone ahead and so that is what this report is going to show you. And deleted anomalies, which is right here, I can look at pattern based. This could indicate some sort of an IT sabotage. So is there a particular user within the network who is going ahead and deleting certain files? you know, in order to take some sort of revenge on or, revenge or the organization. You know, there are been cases of incident threats where users who are disgruntled with the organization, perhaps they've got a very, very poor uh, performance review, or they've been told that, you know, they're, they're going to be laid off. There have been cases where uh, these trusted uh, insiders wanted to take revenge on their organizations, and they've gone ahead and uh, deleted such, uh, you know, critical business critical files. So these kind of anomalies can be detected uh, through, uh, log 360 UEBA by looking at certain behaviors. So that's what this particular report is going to give a security analyst. Great. Now, sometime back, I spoke about risk scores, right? 
Each anomalous activity performed by a user increases that user's risk score. Each anomalous activity performed on an entity increases that entity's risk score. Risk scoring is critical as it allows uh, analysts to focus on the most notable users and entities on the network. So we look at how uh, this whole uh, risk scoring uh, works in Log360 UEBA right now. So let's go back into the dashboard and I'm gonna go over to the user's dashboard. Now take a look at this dashboard right now. Okay, just take a look at this. So we see that there are 441 overall user anomalies. So these are the total number of anomalies that are detected for users in the entire network. Furthermore, there are 182 potential insider threat anomalies. And then there are 294 data exfiltration anomalies and uh, 147 compromised account anomalies. Thankfully, there are no logon anomalies. So that's probably a good thing. But anyways, uh, what, uh, there's one point that I would like to make here. One anomalous activity could actually be a part of both insider threat and data exfiltration. So you could have certain activities that are considered as part of insider threat anomalies that could also uh, be indicative of a data exfiltration. So the activities can overlap. You can have activities here and the same activity can show up over here when we look at data exfiltration also. So that's why the sum of all of these four um, variables over here do not add to the overall anomalies. When it comes to the overall anomaly, anomalies, we're looking at distinct activities. So that's why these four numbers will not add up to the overall anomalies number. Anyways, the other thing that you have here is the risk score uh, distribution. Uh, top 10 users by risk score. And then you have the anomaly trends. Um, then you've got the top 10 users by risk score gain. Now, all of these things are self-explanatory. Then you've also got what uh, you've also got watch listed users. Um, so what are these watch listed users? Now take a look at this here. Now these are all the users in the network uh, arranged in the order of most risky to the least risky. So you've got uh, users with the highest risk score arranged at the top. You've got user one who's got the highest risk score of 56 in the entire network. Now a security analyst can add this user to a watch list very, very quickly. They can add, so right now, uh, user one is not a part of the watch list, but if they want to add this user to a watch list, they can just go and do this here. And this is the watch list icon and immediately user one gets put into that watch list. And this is a ready reckoner for the security analyst. At a glance, the analyst can keep an eye on, the, on this particular user. So how, how's the risk of this particular user moving with time? All of that information will, uh, will be available for the analyst. Now, anyways, apart from that, apart from, uh, you know, putting users on a watch list, the analyst can also deep dive into the um, anomalous activities of particular users. So let's go ahead and click on user one and see how this works. Let me scroll down and you'll see something really, really interesting in just a moment. Now take a look at this. Now, this gives you the whole list of anomalous activities performed by user one over time. It all seems like it started at around this time on this particular day where this user had multiple successful logon attempts. In fact, 102 such attempts where the threshold is just 14. Likewise, uh, uh, with file permission changes, they had 102 such events when in fact the threshold is just 14. They had multiple system file changes, 102 versus 14 once again. And then take a look at this. This is very, very strange behavior, isn't it? Multiple files were modified by the user. In fact, 204 files and folders were modified by user one at this particular time or starting at around this time. When in fact, the threshold is just 28. If a security analyst wants to deep dive into this further, they can just click on this and they can go into event details and get to see all the 204 files and folders that were the target of this user. So probably this is a uh, trusted insider who has gone rogue, who wants to do some sort of damage to the organization. And they are going ahead and you know actually uh, doing a lot of uh, activities on these files and folders. And that is actually being tracked as an anomaly by Log360. But you know, by deep diving over here, the security analyst can get to know exactly what files and folders were modified. So let me quickly go ahead and close this here. Now this confidence level, 
Now take a look at this. The confidence level here indicates the degree to which each of these activities actually affected the risk score. So we see here that each activity did affect the risk score 100%. Now, apart from that, if you go up top, so let me quickly go ahead and do that. Now take a look at this. You also get to see this user's risk score individually for insider threats, data exfiltration, compromised accounts, and logon anomalies. So from the looks of it, it seems like with a risk score of 69 for insider threats and 70 for compromised account, uh, they are likely candidate for uh, insider threats and compromised accounts. Data exfiltration and logon anomalies, well, not so much. Definitely not logon anomalies at, uh, at least. Okay, so far so good. But what leads to these risk scores in the first place? We have calculated all of these risk scores, but how is this calculation actually being done? What is the underlying behind these risk scores? So we'll see, we'll see how this actually works right now. Uh, let's go ahead into settings and we'll see how risk scoring works in a SIM solution like Log360. So now uh, let's go into risk score customization to talk about risk scores. So now you get to see what really is happening in the back end when it comes to risk scoring in machine learning. You have multiple activities arranged according uh, to different categories for each of uh, anomalous, uh, for each of oral anomalies, uh, insider threats, data exfiltration, compromised accounts, and logon anomalies. Now we have arrived at uh, each of these categories and activities after a lot of due diligence and talking to multiple customers. So for example, for overall anomalies, you have two categories here uh, and you can just deep dive into all of the categories, into all of the granular activities that are being analyzed when it comes to overall anomalies. You also have threat detection uh, aggregation and the different activities that are related to that. Then you've got insider threats. Now this can be a very, very, very good example that we can look at. Um, one of the activities that is in indicative of an insider threat is data deletion. And within data deletion, you have other granular activities that are being analyzed, such as abnormal file deletes events. So you can take a look at this. Now take a look at this as well, these values. So you'll notice that this particular activity, abnormal files delete, file deletes, has an associated weight and a decay factor, associated weight of 90 and a decay factor of 20. Um, the weight here affects the extent to which a particular activity affects the risk score. These values are preloaded in the solution, but the analyst does have the option to edit this to suit their needs. And then there's the decay factor. The decay factor reduces the risk score with the passage of time. A high decay factor reduces the risk score very quickly. So that's what the weights and the decay factors are. And this is very, very critical when it comes to risk scoring. Then, you, then you've got alerts. Now with alerts, a security analyst can add an alert profile to be notified whenever something strange occurs in the network. So they can go into manage profiles and add an alert profile. Over here, they just have to give the alert name and a description by going in over here. The severity can be set to attention, trouble, or critical. This is completely up to the security analyst. The alert can be based on a particular report uh, or it can be based on an entity. So the entity here refers to both users and hosts or it can be based on a risk card. So there are three ways to set up an alert. Now let's take an example of a risk card. So let's go ahead and choose risk card here. And you can see that the options change immediately. And when it comes to risk card, uh, there are five different options for which, uh, you know, from which the analyst can choose. So you've got your overall anomalies, insider threats, data exfiltration, compromised accounts, and logon anomalies. These are the different risk cards that we spoke about some time back. So the security analyst can look at any of these risk cards. So let's say that they choose insider threats. And whenever the risk card for insider threat goes beyond a certain threshold score, which is again completely customizable. So let's say that the analyst is choosing the threshold score of 70. And um, you know, whenever the insider threat risk card goes beyond a certain threshold score for particular entities, for particular users, um, 
then uh, this is going to reach that uh, analyst as an alert. So that's what this particular uh, you know alert profile is going to do for the security analyst. Now, obviously, it's not going to be very wise for the analyst to log on to the solution each and every time and get to see what alerts were generated. You've got to have a mechanism for email notification. And that's what uh, the email notification action can do for you. So the analyst just has to check off this box. And anytime this particular rule is triggered, this particular alert rule is triggered, uh, it's also going to trigger an automatic email that gets sent to the uh, security analyst inbox. The exact content of the email can be configured over here as well, once the, uh, the mail server has also been configured. So by doing all of this, this particular alert is going to uh, reach the security analyst inbox. Great. So this is how the solution works overall. Now, before we go ahead, uh, let me just give you a word on peer group analysis. Um, let me jump back into the presentation now. Now, peer group analysis is very critical for reducing false positives. Uh, by that, I mean it is uh, important to classify users and entities into peer groups that exhibit similar characteristics. For example, all users from the marketing department can be part of one peer group. All the users from the pre-sales department can be part of another peer group. Now, obviously, the you know peer group based on marketing, peer group based on um, you know, pre-sales, these are peer groups. Basically, you know, they are based on uh, departments of functions, right? Likewise, all the people with the same job title can be part of uh, another peer group. So all the marketing managers can be part of another peer group. All the pre-sales engineers can be part of another peer group. So there could be several different job titles within a, within a particular department. So all of them are part of one peer group. And then people, what I'm saying is people with the same job title, such as marketing managers or pre-sales engineers, all of them can be a part of a separate peer group. And then, you know, people from a specific geographic location can form yet another peer group. So this is how uh, peer grouping actually works. And, you know, peer groups have to be both static and dynamic. Uh, by static peer grouping, I mean that the information needs to be picked up from Active Directory. So all the information that is contained in uh, Active Directory, such as the user job title, the department that they work for, the manager that they report to, all of that can be uh, used for static peer grouping. And dynamic peer grouping is done when we just look at uh, the behaviors of users and group them based on uh, similar, similar behaviors that they exhibit. Peer grouping allows security analysts to see how risky or non-risky a user is as compared to their peers. In case a user's anomalous behavior is normal for the peer group the user belongs to, the user's risk score need not be increased as much. So this is what clustering algorithms using Constream can do uh, in Log360. So in Log360, we actually use uh, an algorithm called Constream to do peer group analysis. Great. So that's how the solution works. Um, we've also discussed peer group analysis. Now let's step into the second part of this webinar. Let's discuss two main machine learning algorithms that are used to identify anomalies in the behavior of users and entities. Different anomaly detection solutions may use different algorithms, but in log 360, we use robust principal component analysis or RPCA for deciphering time and count anomalies. And we use Markov chains for deciphering pattern anomalies. How does RPCA, uh, how does the RPCA algorithm work? So you may have that question in your mind right now. Well, before we go into RPCA, which is robust principal component analysis, Let's first understand uh, PCA or principal component analysis, and then we'll talk about RPCA. Now take a look at this slide right here. Now in any organization's network, you could have a multitude of data and it gets very hard to visualize all of this data be, uh, beyond a few dimensions. Anyway, to illustrate this concept, let us take this data in this table over here. So you've got a lot of X values and Y values, and I've given some random data here. Um, and we have also calculated the mean for the data. So the mean for the X values, which is just the average is 6.6. .6. The mean for the Y data is 6.4. So in uh, basically with, you know, using all of this data, what it's actually giving us is a neat two dimensional data that is being plotted over here. So I've plotted all of these data points. 
And I've also gone ahead and plotted the mean value. In principal component analysis or PCA, what we do is we first calculate the mean for all the data points like we have done. And then after plotting this data again, like we have done, we shift the origin to the mean. So what we're gonna do is after having this plot on our hands, we're gonna shift the origin of this graph to the mean. So let me go ahead and quickly do that. Take a look at this. I haven't really changed the underlying data. The data still stands where they are. I've just, take a look at the, the green coordinates here. I've just shifted the mean, I've just shifted the origin to the mean. Now to do this is still okay because relative to each other, the points are still as equidistant as before. And then apart from doing that, in addition to doing that, we find a line of best fit, the line that best describes all of these data points. And that is PC1. So this is the line of best fit. It passes through the mean. And this is the line of best fit for these five points. That's A, B, C, D, and E. So that is uh, principal component one. In essence, what we are trying to do with principal component one is uh, we are projecting all of these points, all of these five points onto this particular line. And PC1 is some sort of a combination of the X and Y value. Then you also see that we have principal component two. PC2 is obtained by drawing a line that's perpendicular to PC1. Um, so the reason that we are doing that is we are trying to find a line that's completely independent of PC1. And this is something that we do in statistical uh, math. Uh, when we draw a line that's perpendicular to PC1, we say that uh, PC2 is completely independent of PC1. It, complete, it moves independent of PC1. The, in essence, what we are trying to do with PC2 is uh, PC2 gives a completely new perspective of the underlying data. It's kind of like capturing the view of all of this uh, data, all of these five points from a completely unrelated or independent angle. Now, all of the underlying data can then be explained by principal component one and principal component two. So that's the essence of principal component analysis. So now let's talk about RPCA or robust principal component analysis. Here, the basic concept remains the same, except the line of best fit for PC1 that we drew earlier uh, when it came to uh, PCA will also account for outliers. So here you see that because there is an extreme outlier, you see that point E is, a, is an extreme anomaly. It doesn't go with any of the rest of the data. And that is skewing the, the, the line of best fit to a full extent. So that is why uh, this line is over here. In fact, if uh, E was not here, if we didn't have this anomaly, this line would have shifted a little bit to the left. So that's what we are trying to account for in, when it comes to robust principle and uh, component analysis. It'll uh, basically this uh, algorithm, it will take into account that there's an extreme outlier in the underlying data. And then once that is done, it is down to solving for a matrix. The actual underlying data is a sum of a low rank matrix that accounts for all the clustered uh, data set uh, that is over here. So these four points over here. So it is a sum of a low rank matrix that is indicative of this cluster. And then there is also gonna be a sparse matrix that accounts for all the anomalies such as point E. We calculate the anomaly and show it to the user in the interface of the solution. The expected value uh, for E is also calculated and based on the deviation, a risk score is then calculated. So that's how RPCA works. And this is used for time and count anomalies. Now let's go into Markov chains. Like I said earlier, Markov chains are used for identifying pattern anomalies. A Markov chain is a sequence of stochastic events where the probability of the next event in a chain depends only upon the state of the current event. The probabilities of successive states are calculated to determine how risky a particular behavior is. Each action performed by a user or entity is compared to a list of probable actions. If an event is not found in the list of probable uh, events, the UEBA system would see this action as an anomaly and then it would raise an alert. So now let's take a very simple example that I have here as an image. Let's say that a user has failed to log on twice. Then at that stage, what's the probability that this user will log on correctly on the third attempt? And what is the probability that this user will then access a database server and download important customer information onto a USB drive? Based on past behavior, 
the UEBA system will calculate the probability of each subsequent pattern and give a risk score. So that's how Markov chains work in uh, log 360 UEBA. And this algorithm is used for identifying pattern anomalies. So we have talked about time count and pattern anomalies and how they are accounted for in log 360 UEBA. Now let's take a step back and talk about cyber security of the future. In the years to come, artificial intelligence and machine learning are going to be leveraged by attackers in very sophisticated ways for advanced attacks. Intelligent attacks that self-propagate is a realistic proposition. Attackers could also make use of machine learning algorithms that automatically learn the computational environment of the victim and collect knowledge on what techniques worked earlier and what did not. Attackers could also do one more thing. All the machine learning models that organizations use for defense, well, they depend on training data. Now think for a moment, what if attackers could poison this data and the training model uh, would be completely wrong and anomalies are not going to be detected? Because you know, even with machine learning, you're still feeding the data, right? Garbage in, you're going to get garbage out. So if the training data itself is wrong, if the data that is used to train the machine learning model if an attacker gets a hold of that training data and poisons it, uh, the results of the machine learning model is also going to be wrong. So that is what we can probably expect attackers to do in the future. As cybersecurity defenders of the future, we must be able to sift through large numbers of, of incidents to identify and take corrective action. We should be able to pick up on the small clues that are scattered throughout the network. We should be able to leverage artificial intelligence to set up self-configuring networks. We should also rely heavily on using the best self-learning models in tandem with something that's called intent-based network security. Great, so that's what attackers can do. And this is what we as security defenders need to do for the future. Now, uh, I do have a few resources uh, that I wanna share with you before uh, I end this webinar. Um, so these are the next steps. Please do visit our UEBA page. Um, let me quickly navigate onto the page. So this is the UEBA microsite that we have developed uh, in Manage Engine. Let me copy paste this URL so that you can access this whenever uh, convenience is permitted. And I would also like you to access a particular ebook where you can get more information about uh, Anomaly detection and UEBA. And that's this right here understanding uh, UEBA, how machine learning can help secure your business. So I'll go ahead and post this URL on the chat as well. And you can access this whenever you want. So there, uh, you've got to have both of those uh, URLs on the chat right now. Of course, you know, we are always open for a personalized demo. So if, uh, in case you want a personalized demo uh, where you want us to take, uh, take you through certain use cases, obviously in a 40 minute webinar like this one, there's only so much that I can cover. There are only limited use cases that I can cover. Um, so if you want us to take you through certain uh, use cases, please let us know and we'd be happy to do that. Mm -hmm.